Hey everyone, and welcome back to Decoding AI, a conversation. Now, you might have been expecting to hear Doctor's voice today, but he's been pulled into some really exciting development work. So, my name is Chinita, and as the media AI representative for Doctor IT Solutions, I'll be your new host, guiding you through the rest of this journey into AI. Before we jump in, I just want to quickly remind everyone what this series is all about. We know there's a lot of buzz, a lot of complicated talk about AI, and it's easy to feel a bit lost or left behind. Our goal here is simple, to break it all down in a friendly chat without the confusing jargon so that anyone can understand the basics. Now, I know it's been a little while since episode one, so let's do a quick catch up on where Doctor left us. If you remember, he took us right back to the beginning. He explained that AI isn't some new invention. The dream of thinking machines started way back in the 1950s with thinkers like Alan Turing. The most important moment he told us about was in 1956 at a place called Dartmouth College. That's where a group of brilliant researchers officially gave this new field its name, artificial intelligence. The key thing to remember was their incredible optimism. They honestly believed that machines as smart as humans were just around the corner. So the big question is, what happened next? To help us answer that, I'm not doing it alone. I've brought in a true expert. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Professor Duncan. Professor, thank you so much for joining us. The pleasure is all mine, Janita. I've been following the series and I'm excited to jump in. Fantastic. Well, let's get right to it then. The pioneers of AI were incredibly optimistic. What happened when that big dream met the cold, hard reality? <laughs> That's the perfect question, Janita. Reality often has other plans. The pioneers ran into two enormous roadblocks almost immediately. First, think of their tools. Their ideas were from the 21st century, but their computers were from the 1960s. Huge, slow machines that simply didn't have the muscle for the heavy lifting AI required. Okay, so it's like trying to build a spaceship with bicycle parts. Exactly. A perfect analogy. Their second big problem was how they were trying to teach the machines. Their main strategy was to write a rule for everything. Imagine trying to explain a simple thing, like a dog with rules. You'd say, it has four legs, but so does a chair. It barks, but some dogs are quiet. For every rule, you find a dozen exceptions. The task just becomes impossibly huge. So with progress being so slow, I'm guessing the people funding all this research started getting a bit impatient? You've hit the nail on the head. The grand promises hadn't delivered grand results. So the money from governments and big companies started to dry up. This period from the mid 70s through the 80s became famously known as the AI winter. The name says it all. The excitement cooled right down and the big dream of creating a thinking machine was left out in the cold. It was a very frustrating time. Wow, so did they just give up or did they find a different way to move forward? They didn't give up, they got practical. They changed the goal. The thinking became, all right, maybe we can't build a machine that thinks about everything, but what if we could build a machine that's a world-class expert at just one specific thing? And that led to the creation of expert systems. An expert system? Okay, that sounds interesting. Can you break that down for us? Of course. Let's use a story. Imagine a master car mechanic, Sipo. He's worked on one type of engine for 30 years and knows it inside and out. In his head, he has a mental rule book. If you hear a clunk clunk sound on startup, then check the starter motor first. An expert system was an attempt to download Sipo's brain into a computer to turn his entire mental rulebook into software. The computer could then ask a junior mechanic questions and guide them to the solution. Ah, I see. So they were actually useful in the real world. Very useful. They were used in hospitals to help diagnose diseases, in banks to approve loans. They were a commercial success. They proved that AI could provide real value but they had one major flaw. Let me guess, if a brand new electric car came into Sipo's workshop, his old rule book wouldn't help him at all. You've got it exactly. Expert systems were brittle. They were brilliant at what they knew, but they couldn't learn anything new. 
they were stuck with the rules they were given. That seems like a really good place to take a quick pause. My brain is already buzzing with all this. And speaking of useful tools, this series is made possible by our sponsor, Koke. Koke is a fantastic mobile app that helps you find live comedy and music events happening all across South Africa. So, while we're busy learning about smart systems, you can use a smart app to plan a great night out. And hey, while you're thinking about it, please take a second to like this video and subscribe to the Koke channel so you don't miss any future episodes. It really helps us out. Anyway, Professor, sorry to interrupt, you were saying these systems couldn't learn. So what was the solution? A brilliant question, Shanita, and it leads us to the next great leap in thinking, machine learning. The idea was to flip the whole process on its head. Instead of giving the computer a finished rulebook, what if we could teach it how to learn for itself, just by showing it examples? Okay, now that sounds like what we think of as learning. How does that work in practice? Think about how a child learns what a dog is. You don't give them a textbook, you just point out dogs. Big dogs, small dogs, fluffy dogs. The child's brain sees thousands of examples and starts to figure out the general pattern of a dog on its own. Machine learning does the same thing. To teach a computer to spot spam email, you don't write rules. You just show it thousands of emails you already know are spam and thousands that are good. And the machine just figures it out? It figures out the patterns. It might notice that spam emails often contain certain words or come from strange addresses. It learns the characteristics of spam from the data. So when a new email arrives, it can make a very educated guess based on all the examples it's seen. You never told it the rules, it discovered the rules for itself. Wow, okay, that feels like a massive difference. You're moving from just following instructions to actually discovering knowledge. It was a complete game changer, a fundamental shift. It was the idea that would eventually end the AI winter and set the stage for the entire modern era of AI we're living in today. Professor, this has been incredibly insightful. Before we wrap up, could you just quickly summarize the key steps in this part of AI's journey for us? Certainly. First, the early AI dream hit the wall of weak computers and the difficulty of writing rules, leading to the AI winter. Second, to solve smaller problems, researchers created expert systems, which were like digital rulebooks from human experts. Third, these systems were useful but couldn't learn, which was a major limitation. And finally, that led to the rise of machine learning, a new approach focused on teaching computers to learn from examples, not just from pre-written rules. That's brilliant. So the big takeaway is that AI had to learn how to learn. Thank you so much, Professor. Next time, I want to ask you what happens when this powerful idea of machine learning gets combined with the two superpowers of the modern age, massive amounts of data and incredibly powerful computers. I have a feeling that's when things really start to take off. I look forward to it, Janita. Thanks for listening, everyone. Catch you in the next one.